watching the flow of commands interactively. We're going to take a look at some of the built-in options, some packages, how they're implemented, and then we're going to break down some changes that I made to a package called Keypression. Welcome to Emacs at Lunch. For our motivating problem, let's consider that you want to watch your inputs while you're in the middle of doing something. If you want to take a look at what you just did, or you're trying to inspect a tricky workflow, or you're doing a live demonstration, describe key is not an option. Within the built-in solutions, we have some unique capabilities that the packages we're going to look at do not replace. First up is lossage. Lossage is excellent whenever you entered some commands, you don't know what you did, you can't reproduce it, and you want to find out what did I just do. So I'm going to open up lossage, and it's already showing me the commands that I did. I didn't have to plan ahead, it's already got the results. The only problem is that, as you can see, I'm entering in commands, but nothing's happening. It's not live updating. Got to press G for revert buffer, and then I can get the new results. Okay, so we're going to close lossage. And now we're going to take a look at Dribble. Dribble is basically the raw inputs. Now, by default, Dribble is only going to output to a file, and you're supposed to open that later. But in the command log package, I went ahead and created a thing called Tail Dribble. So, Tail Dribble does what it sounds like it's going to tail that file. So, every second it uh, updates and there I did a mouse drag you can see all the inputs now if I do some more keys eventually we'll we'll get those inputs in there uh, one of the other interesting capabilities of dribble is that it shows us the inputs before input remapping so I have meta G remapped to control G so I'm gonna sit here and press some meta G's and some control G's and you'll notice that key pression down there it thinks that these are the same thing. It has no idea. It thinks that they're just straight repeats. But if you look at the dribble, you can tell that dribble is able to see that these are completely distinct inputs. Okay, so that's it for dribble. And now we're gonna look at repurposing watch variable. And the value that we're gonna watch is called this command. Now, this command is normally updated from C. So we won't really be able to see that many of the updates, but we will be able to learn something if we check it out. So I'm going to come down here and uh, go ahead and activate this hook, and then we're going to open up messages, and then what I'm going to do, we're going to do some next line here, and you can see, we'll do some more so we can we can make it a little bit more obvious. Okay, so um, these lines here, this this is the log, and um, what is happening is that whenever I do meta x next line, the value is being updated from within Lisp by IV. So whenever I enter in that command, it overwrites the value of this command, and we can see that update. Okay, so that's it for using watch variable. Let's go ahead and uh, remove our command hook, and now we're going to look at some packages. So we're going to highlight three packages, keypression, keycast, and command log. All three of these packages have the same basic operating principle. They look at the value of this command during the pre-command and the post-command. The main way that they're really different is how they display the commands. So we're going to turn on keycast in the header line mode. We're going to turn on command log in a side window, and then we're going to turn on keypression, which uses its own frames to look like it's drawing over the entire frame. And then we're going to play a little bit of Tetris so that you can see that depending on their configurations, they'll show a little bit different output, but they're all basically just doing the same things, displaying it different ways. One important nuance that I just fixed in the command log in the key pression package is how they react to meta X. And we're going to do some forward chars from the meta X menu to show you what I mean. Notice how command log and key pression are showing us forward char, whereas keycast is showing us IV done. This is a result of a behavior I added to command log and key pression where they can look at the pre-command and the post-command. And if the pre-command is going to delegate to another command, they can show us the post-command. And there's some other corner cases where the value of this command will not be updated in the post-command, and they have to show us the pre-command. So now I've turned everything back off. I only scratched the surface with the configuration of these packages because they support a lot of options to filter commands and to display them slightly differently. But the best part is being able to show the output where you want without having to do anything. You just turn it on and go. 
So if you want to see what's going on without going back to describe key all the time or you want to show people what's going on, this is a great solution. Now we're going to go over some changes that I made to the key pression package. This is going to add some context so that if you go to the PR and look at the commits, you can understand what each commit does. When I first found the key pression package, I really liked the results, but it did have some limitations. It only used a pre-command, so it couldn't show me what command am I running with MetaX. It would show me that I was using MetaX, but not what I picked. It didn't have that great of filtering options, and then it had some open issues on GitHub I noticed that looked like I could probably clean them up. It would create a lot of taskbar windows, and some of the windows would be left behind if you closed Emacs. And then sometimes I wouldn't really get the faces that I configured, so I'd have all white text on yellow backgrounds. So let's take a look at how we fixed all that. So the PR is up on Chintaro's repo. You can go read it. It should be a very easy to read PR because I've divided up behavioral changes from non-behavioral changes and then really gone step by step. That said, I'm going to try to add a little bit of context and look at this as more of a practical e-list programming exercise. The first thing we're going to look at is getting the faces to appear correctly. What the author had done so far was set the frame parameters for foreground and background. Usually the most flexible and robust way to add a face to your package is to just declare a face and inherit from one of the lower level faces. That way it's going to be up to the theming system and if the user wants to override any attribute of the face they can. However, in this case, to take advantage of what we have already, which is two user configured color options, I went ahead and set some face attributes for these frames. Now when you're using multiple independent frames, you can go ahead and just set the face attribute for the whole frame. If you were doing this with buffers, you would probably have to use face remapping, and you usually don't want to set the face for the entire frame, but like I said, Keypression is using multiple independent frames, and it's the only thing that's using those frames, so you can just go ahead and set it for the whole frame. Next, we're going to fix up some of the window manager behavior. So, first of all, there's a skip taskbar option. That tells the window manager, yeah, don't put this in the taskbar. And then uh, I want to highlight user size and user position. These essentially tell the window manager that it's not the program requesting to put the window somewhere, it's the user. And it, it's a way of kindly asking the window manager to respect the dimensions and position that you're giving it instead of doing what it wants to do. The other options are probably no op in practice, but look them up in the manual if you're curious. Next we're going to set up the delete before parameter. The goal of this is that if you've got multiple frames open, and then key pression has got its frames open, when one of those frames closes, the key pression frames should go away with that frame. Next, we want to go ahead and fix up the command ignoring. We're going to add an option, and that option is a list. We're going to start with the easiest implementation, which is we just look for commands in the list. If the command is a member of the list, we ignore the command. And then in a follow-up commit, we're going to make that option accept a function as well. So if the user gives us a callable, we'll call it with the command. And by allowing the user to provide a function, it's much easier for them to filter out a whole range of commands because they can use pattern matching and logic instead of listing them all individually. So I'm not going to look at every commit, but I wanted to mention that some of the commits just make some of the functions more pure. And the significance is that instead of allowing those functions to reread values downstream, they're going to listen to what we're passing in upstream. So that makes things a little bit more articulable at a high level. In order to be able to select between the pre or post command value of this command, it was important to be able to pass in the command that we wanted the downstream to pay attention to. Now we're getting closer to the money. We want the package to be able to look at the pre-command hook and the post-command hook. Since we can't decide what we're going to do anyway until the post-command hook, I went ahead and moved all of the work into the post-command hook. Then we're going to add a pre-command hook. It doesn't do anything yet. And then we're going to store the value of this command keys during the pre-command hook and make it available for the post-command hook. And we're almost done. We're going to add a user option that says, do you want to read the pre-command hook or the post-command hook? And then down in the post-command hook body, we look at that option and we decide, are we going to show the value of this command or the stored command that we recorded during the pre-command hook? Lastly, we're going to clean up some special cases. The special cases are created by commands that are only called to select or to modify a follow-on command. What these commands do 
is they revert the value of this command. During the pre-command, we can check this command, we'll see those commands, but then by the time we get to the post-command hook, they've reverted it to an arbitrary command. So to avoid showing these arbitrary commands, when we see one of these special case values, we're always going to show the pre-command because that's the only one that can make sense. So go take a look at the PR if you want to get a closer look at the code. And I'll try to make this the last video that I do on the command loop so that you never have to listen to the value of this command during the pre-command or the post-command ever again. So now that we've seen a lot of ways to show off commands, my one request is that when you're doing a presentation or you're talking on Reddit or writing something on Stack Overflow, don't just show me the keys because they don't really mean the same thing to everybody. Emacs is a programmable interface to a computer and we want to emphasize that on this channel. We're going to program what every single key does, we're going to make our own commands, and we're going to treat the defaults like they're meant to be broken. Command log is on Positron's GitHub, Keypression is on Chintaro's GitHub, our PR is open there, and Keycast is on Tarsius's GitHub, he runs Magit. Anyway, it's all linked below. We're in the process of listing command log on Melpa, and I did email Chintaro, so hopefully we'll get that merged. In the meantime, you can install via one of the package managers designed for using Git repos, or you can clone the repo and set up the load path manually. Coming up, we've got a video on time and timers, a talk on ecosystem sustainability, and then we've got another programming video on extending org tree slide by adding some speaker notes. And then I'm going to use Transient to streamline how I set up for different kinds of presentations. See you next time.